The merge is upon us. In a few short months, we could see Ethereum finally transition to proof of stake, an event that has been in development for years and is one of the most hotly anticipated events of 2022. So what could this mean for the network's scalability? Are there any risks that are hidden under the surface? And what does this all mean for the price of ETH? Well, that's exactly what I'll be exploring today. Don't go anywhere. Sorry, folks, I'm, uh, I'm expecting a call. Just um, talk amongst yourselves. Hello, Guy speaking. Hello there, Guy. It's your cousin Angus here. How are you getting on down there in England? Oh, hi, Angus. Yeah, I, um, I wasn't expecting you to call. Um, yeah, uh, all good here. I'm, I'm just about to shoot a video, actually. Uh, all well up in Scotland? I, no bad. It's quite warm here the day as it happens. So what's this video you're about to shoot then? You're no one of them weirdos what goes and bothers lasses in the street, are you? What? No, no. Of course not. Uh, no, I make um, I make videos about cryptocurrency on, on YouTube. Oh, aye, crypto. Aye, a pal of mine just bought 500 quid of doggy coins or something. So you're kind of like a financial advisor or sorts then, eh? Ah, uh, no, Angus, no, nothing of the kind. I'm not a financial advisor and the videos I make are for educational and entertainment purposes only. Ugh, oh, that's too bad. Well, I'll have to watch one of your videos and see what all this crypto stuff is about then. You'd better get on and shoot it, eh? I will. Uh, thanks, Angus. Yeah. Uh, good to hear from you. Um, any plans for the, for the rest of the day? Aye, well, it looks like the sun might be coming out, so I'm going to put some Factor 50 on and catch a few rays. You take care now, guys. So long. Right, it's getting proper toasty in here. Sorry, where was I? Oh yes, we need to start with a bit of background as to where we are right now. So for those who've been following the ETH 2.0 roadmap as closely as I have, you won't be surprised to learn that the actual name, ETH 2.0, has been retired. This happened a few weeks after my last Ethereum update video and it took many people by surprise. The folks at the Ethereum Foundation broke down their thinking in a blog post on the Foundation website, which I've linked to down below. The Foundation was of the view that the term 2.0 was confusing as it implied that there would perhaps be two different Ethereums. According to the post, quote, One major problem with the ETH2 branding is that it creates a broken mental model for new users of Ethereum. They intuitively think that ETH1 comes first and ETH2 comes after, or that ETH1 ceases to exist once ETH2 exists. Of course, neither of those are true, something that we'll get back to in a bit. They took the view that it's much clearer to refer to ETH1 as the execution layer and ETH2 as the consensus layer, with both of these combined being Ethereum. This move by the foundation split the community in half, with some for and others against. It is true that most have come to associate the upgrades with ETH 2.0, and this could further muddy the waters in the eyes of those new to the ecosystem. However, the foundation does have a point. There are already stories about malicious actors who have attempted to use the ETH 2.0 moniker as a way to scam newbies, telling them to swap their ETH 1 for ETH2 tokens, for instance. Moreover, not only was ETH2.0 a bit of a misnomer from a technical standpoint, but also when it comes to expectations. It created the perception that, with this upgrade, we would see ETH2.0, when in reality, the Ethereum upgrades were a multi-stage process with numerous different steps. That is exactly how these things are likely to progress from here, with the first upgrade being the merge, followed by sharding. So, that's the name change. Now, terminology aside, we're inching ever closer to that all-important merge event. That's because about two weeks ago, a merge did indeed take place, on the Kiln testnet, that is. For those who don't know, we had a similar testnet merge late last year on the Kintsugi testnet. In that case, there were a few bugs that needed to be corrected, but it was invaluable preparation for the recent Kiln testnet merge. This was largely successful, short of a single client that was not producing blocks consistently. 
The reason why Kiln is so important is because it was the last merged testnet created before all the existing public testnets were upgraded. This means that we could well be on our way to the merge happening on the mainnet in the next few months. Core developers such as Danny Ryan have been alluding to the merge happening, quote, soon in recent tweets. You also have the comments by Ethereum co-founder and Consensus CEO Joe Lubin. According to him, the merge will come in Q2 or at the latest Q3. And I think that Joe's comments tend to add weight. That's because as one of the biggest Ethereum dev companies, Consensus has to plan for these timelines. All of its products and roadmaps have to adjust based on where there could be protocol level changes on Ethereum. So that's the lie of the land with the merge. Exciting times ahead for the Ethereum community. But what impact is this upgrade likely to have? Well, I think the most important thing to understand right now is what impact the move to proof of stake is going to have on scalability and gas fees. And the truth is, not very much. Allow me to explain. You see, there are three layers on Ethereum. You have the execution layer, the consensus layer, and the data availability layer. The merge will be an update to the consensus layer. On this layer, it will no longer be miners propagating the blocks, but staking validators. However, the execution layer will remain unchanged, and it's over here where you'll be paying the gas. This confusion around the upgrade is something that Vitalik has himself tried to clear up on numerous occasions. For example, I found his answer to this Reddit post about proof-of-stake scaling to be quite illuminating. I'll leave a link to it in the description, but the TLDR is that reducing block times could lead to a reduction in security and decentralization because of connection latency. I talked about this in much greater detail in my video on the fastest blockchains, which I'll leave a link to in the top right for you to come back to later. So the point is that proof of stake won't be the gas fee panacea that some perceive it to be. I also don't want to be too much of a killjoy when I say that the next upgrade, sharding, is unlikely to have that much of an impact on base layer fees either, at least not until we get execution layer sharding. So you may then be asking, where is this wonderful scaling fix we were told about? Well, that will come in the form of upgraded shard chains in conjunction with layer two execution layers. That's right, the ETH layer two industry is heating up and there are projects out there raising hundreds of millions, nay, billions of dollars to develop on top of the ETH base layer. For example, just last week, we had Optimism raise over 150 million in a Series B that would value it at $1.6 billion. That's not the most important number though. According to Optimism, its scaling solution has helped Ethereum users save over $1 billion in fees. Then you have the likes of Arbitrum, which raised $120 million last year for a valuation of $1.2 billion. This L2 has seen considerable growth over the past year and currently has over $3.1 billion of total value locked. Then, of course, there is the largest layer two of them all, the Polygon network. This has the highest TVL standing at over $3.8 billion. There are, of course, a number of other layer twos out there that I shan't go into here. The point is that rather than waiting for that panacea promised by the Ethereum transition, you can reduce gas fees right now using some of these scaling options. If you don't know how to, then I'm sure there are videos out there that could help you out. Yes, there are some challenges when it comes to wider adoption on these layer twos, but I think this comes down to the number of wallets or exchanges that support them. However, there are shifts afoot to make this work. Okay, so the move to proof of stake is not really going to help with scaling. So what will it help with? Well, one of the primary advantages will, of course, be the reduction in energy use and hence a much greener chain. Even if you aren't concerned about the environmental impacts of crypto, there are other really important reasons as to why this is beneficial to ETH, something I'll get onto in a bit. But putting all of this aside, is there any other reason as to why we should look forward to the merge? Indeed, there is. If you've been following crypto Twitter for any period of time, you'll have heard about the tokenomic implications of the merge. More specifically, the reference to, quote, ultrasound money. That's because post-merge, the amount of ETH being issued will drop considerably. The consensus estimates for the extent of the drop 
are around 90%. So, if we were to assume a current yearly ETH issuance of 5.4 million per year, about 15,000 ETH per day, that is expected to drop to about 500,000 ETH per year or 1,500 ETH per day, an inflation rate that will go from about 4.3% pre merge to 0.43% post merge. Just to give you a bit of context here, the current Bitcoin inflation rate is about 1.7%. That would imply that ETH will be issued at a rate four times lower than that of Bitcoin. But wait, there's more. That is because, thanks to a little something called EIP-1559, ETH has a built-in fee burn mechanism. Now, I've covered this several times in the past and will link to some of my previous videos on it. But, quite simply, EIP-1559 introduced a mechanism whereby a small portion of the ETH gas fee, called the base fee, is now burned. This means that this ETH is being removed from circulation permanently. Currently, the burn rate is around 1 million ETH per year. So, if we were to assume an issuance of only half a million per year, it would imply a net negative issuance of half a million ETH per year. That's right, a deflation rate of about 0.5% per year. Now do you see why it's being labelled as ultrasound money? Speaking of which, if you want to take a look at all of these numbers, then I encourage you to visit the website ultrasound.money. There, you can do a whole lot of things to simulate the merge. For example, you can adjust the amount that's been staked, as well as the base fee and the merge date. It'll allow you to project out those numbers and benchmark the supply schedule for yourself. This is important because it's these metrics that will help to determine issuance and burn rates once the merge comes along. So, why is this important for you, the ETH holder? Well, you don't need to be an economics graduate to know that an asset that's decreasing in supply but with a constant demand will see an increase in its price. But that's of course assuming that demand to hold ETH remains the same. If the on-chain metrics are anything to go by, that's not the best assumption to make. That's because more recently we've seen some of the largest outflows yet from exchanges. For example, According to data from Into the Block, last week over 180,000 ETH was withdrawn from exchanges on a single day. This can also be confirmed with data from the folks over at Glassnode, with their chart that shows the total exchange balances. As you can see, the balance on exchanges is at the lowest level it's been since August of 2018. Crazy. So, what does this all mean? Well, the less ETH there is on the exchanges, the less there is ready to sell and hence suppress the price. Those people who are moving their ETH from the exchanges are probably doing one of three things. Hodling it in self-custody, using it in DeFi protocols, or they are depositing it in the ETH staking contract and earning staking rewards. That latter one is actually quite popular and keeps swelling day by day. It now stands at a staggering 10.6 million ETH. Mind-blowing. So that's demand right now. It seems to be picking up quite aggressively ahead of the merge, a period which will see it become deflationary. But it's the demand that we're likely to see after the merge that has me quite excited. You see, despite how alluring it is to send your funds to the staking contract, there are still many who are holding off. This is especially true for those institutional investors who would like certainty around the merge event. This includes whether the merge will go off without a hitch. There is always a tail risk, as well as the certainty around being able to withdraw. That's because currently, if you want to stake your ETH in the contract, you can't withdraw. Yes, there are liquid staking options out there, but these are far from optimal. So the feeling from institutional investors is that they're adopting a wait-and-see approach to the merge. While they would love to be able to lock up some ETH and earn those returns, they aren't too keen about the prospect of not being able to unstake until the merge takes place. Now, I know what you're thinking. What about those who are likely to want to withdraw ETH from the staking contract? Won't there also be investors eager to do that? Well, there may be, but it would be suboptimal from a returns perspective. That's because the staking rewards are likely to go up after the merge. We'll get onto that in a bit. But even if they did want to unstake their ETH, there are limits on the speed with which this can be done. I covered the maths that explains this in my most recent ETH vid, 
linked to in the description below for you folks. But it's not just certainty around staking parameters that investors are after. There's a very important consideration for institutional investors specifically, and that is around ESG, or environmental, social, and governance. Yes, the buzzword that elicits really strong feelings is, in fact, shaping investment strategies. That's because not only have ESG credentials become criteria which large asset managers use to benchmark potential investments, but it's also become a pretty strong mandate for some of them. And when it comes to cryptocurrencies, the perception around proof-of-work mining being bad for the environment has meant that many of these large institutional investors put it in their ESG naughty bucket. This is a problem that I talked about in much greater detail in my video about ESG, and you know where to go for that good stuff. Now, I know that this environment FUD is completely overblown, and I've talked about it on the channel many times before. However, one cannot deny that proof-of-stake is magnitudes more efficient than proof-of-work. Whereas for proof-of-work you need mining rigs or ASICs, with proof-of-stake all you need is a server. This means that when Ethereum switches to proof-of-stake, the power required will be a fraction of what it is now. In fact, according to this blog post on the Ethereum Foundation website, the network will require 99.95% less energy than it does now, a 2000x reduction. To give you an idea of this energy use in comparison with current proof-of-work mining, take a look at this helpful graphic from said blog post. A screw compared to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I'll leave a link to the blog post in the description for you as it helps break down those numbers in greater detail. But the point is that the moment we merge and blocks start being propagated by validators, Ethereum no longer falls foul of the E in ESG. That means it becomes a lot more appealing as an investment to these ESG conscious managers. This at a time when these investors can get access to an asset that will allow them to earn staking rewards and one that has a decreasing supply. It's a win-win-win. So we could be in a situation where billions in institutional money that's been sitting on the sidelines is ready to be invested in ETH. And one can only imagine what that could do to the price of an asset that's deflationary. And speaking of price, I'm sure that this is something a lot of you are interested in. Am I right? One of the most interesting research reports that I've come across analyzing the price of ETH post-merge is this one. It's an institutional research report coming from David Dong over at Coinbase, and it was released last month. Not only does it try to come up with a price of ETH based on some well-established valuation criteria, but it also looks at various scenarios for staking returns. So, quite simply, what he's trying to do in this report is to come up with a reasonable net present value of ETH at the merge. Essentially, the price that a rational investor should be willing to pay for ETH on merge, assuming that they're going to stake their ETH. The first thing that I wanted to show you was this table over here, which has all the variables that we can use in that model. They are the ETH balance in staking contract on merge, net transaction fees, base reward factor, total rewards to validators, and those rewards annualized as a percentage. Then David has broken this down according to three different scenarios of ETH balance on the merge. Given that there are already over 10 million ETH locked in the staking contract, I think we can eliminate scenario one. So we have the potential staking returns assuming scenario two and three there. Those are 11.8 million in the staking contract and 14.2 million. Using these two different parameters, David has calculated staking returns over 10.2% and 8.9% respectively. To put that into context, the current rewards that you earn in the staking contract are about 5.4%, assuming that you're running a validator. So this is why I said earlier that it could be that much more appealing for stakers to keep their ETH locked up when we hit the merge. Anywho, what these staking rewards allow us to do is to calculate a stream of future crypto cash flows that we can use in an NPV calculation. Now, there were two ways that David ran these calculations. 
One was to assume a perpetual and constant stream of ETH rewards into the future. That is using this formula over here, which calculates the NPV of infinite cash flows, i.e. a perpetuity. In this table, he came up with these estimates of the NPV based on the probability of being in that state. However, as he admits, this is a bit unrealistic, as ETH staking rewards are variable and will adjust based on the total amount that's in the staking contract. That therefore means that a more accurate model will be one that has more than one stage of cash flows. This is sometimes called a, quote, two-stage dividend model and is used in equity valuations. Although this may look a bit complicated at first, it's actually just two separate DCF formulas. One that is over a defined period, n, and the other that is a perpetuity stream of income from time n to infinity. Anywho, for this model, he's assumed a starting price as the average price of ETH this year, 3K, which I think seems reasonable. He also assumed a 12.2% staking reward for the first three months in the calculation over here. That's based on the assumption of 9.4 million ETH in the staking contract. However, I think that needs to be adjusted down, as we have now over 10.6 million in the staking contract. So, assuming similar levels of growth between now and the merge, we can assume that we will reach the 11.8 million total ETH staked at that point. That would imply a first stage reward rate, S1, of 10.2%. Then, I think that it's safe to assume that we could reach the 14.2 million staked amount, scenario 3, within three months of the merge. This would imply a staking reward of 8.9%, S2 here. We'll also have to assume that as more people stake their ETH, this reward rate is likely to linearly decline over time. David has used an assumption of a growth factor of minus 0.5% here. Finally, when it comes to the discount rate R, he's assumed a rate of 4.82%. Still with me so far? It gets a tad complicated, so I've linked to the full report in the description. Anyways, based on these parameters, we run it through our calculator and the grand total for the NPV on the merge of, drumroll please, $5,034. This is of course slightly lower than the estimate that David had on the merge, but that's just because we'll have a lower initial rate given that more ETH is being staked. As David also mentions, given that this is a DCF model, it can be highly sensitive to any parameter changes. So, if we were to assume that there would be no fall in the long-term return rate, the NPV value would be $5,549. So, what does this mean? Well, it shows the present value of those future ETH rewards for those staking on the merge. You can think of it as analogous to the fundamental value that someone can place on ETH. Now, of course, price may differ from value, and this would assume someone would be staking. Moreover, this model is pretty assumption-driven. But I'll ask you this. If large institution investors run similar numbers on the date of the merge and arrive at these estimates of value, wouldn't they perceive ETH to be undervalued right now? And if that's the case, why should it be different for any of us? That's it for most of the video. A few closing thoughts, though. It's no secret that I'm pretty darned excited about the merge. The numbers don't lie, and the implications of ETH going deflationary are profound. No, it's not going to be the scaling panacea that we may have hoped for, but there are solutions out there right now that could help alleviate those gas fees. Layer 2s are popular and growing, and there's no reason that we can't leverage these in the meantime and in the future. Besides that, the incentives for institutional investment in ETH post-merge are immense. Strong long-term returns on an asset that's decreasing in supply and is environmentally friendly. As I've shown, ETH is undervalued right now based on pure fundamental analysis. However, I happen to think that even this model is severely undervaluing ETH in the long term. It can't capture other factors such as network effects and other crypto-specific valuation criteria. Quite simply, you can't really value the most revolutionary technology of our time the same way Warren Buffett values a stock. Now, if this video comes off as bullish on ETH, then, well, it's meant to. However, I'm not blissfully ignorant of the potential risks out there. For example, there's no guarantee we will see the merge in the next few months. Yes, all indications point to it, but it can, 
and has been pushed out. Then you also have to assume that there are no issues when it comes to the merge. While there is rigorous testing going on, nothing comes close to the amount at stake on a live switch. Should there be any issues on merge, it could severely damage the long-term reputation of Ethereum. It's also worth noting that ETH does face competition. Layer 1s that are highly scalable already and do not need to rely on Layer 2 networks in order to make them affordable. There's always the chance that they devour ETH market share on account of their usability. Or perhaps we head into a severe bear market just in time for the merge. While there is long-term value in ETH, if the crypto markets are falling through the floor, the sentiment will be such that those institutional investors are likely to remain hesitant. So, these are the known risks. There are, of course, unknown risks that by their very nature means I can't elucidate them. But, like any financial model, you have to weigh up these risks and opportunities and place a probability on them to get your expected value. What conclusion do you come to? Whew, that was a long one, but I'm really keen to get your feedback here. So what's your view on ETH? When do you think we're likely to see the merge? Let me know in the comments below. Oh, and while you're down there, you cannot miss my socials page. Over here, I have the only official links to the places you can follow me outside of YouTube. These include my Telegram channel, where I do daily market updates, Twitter for my latest thoughts and the occasional shitpost, Instagram and TikTok for memes, behind the scenes and short form content, and my newsletter, a once weekly take on everything crypto. It's also where I share a breakdown of my personal portfolio. And if you want to bag yourself some exclusive deals, then you may also want to check out my deals page. Over here, I have promos and discounts exclusively for the viewers of this channel. All of that goodness is down below in that description box. Finally, I hope this video was helpful, folks. Give this crypto champ a like if you liked it and a sub if you loved it. Oh, and don't forget those notifications. You don't want to miss what else I have coming through. My name is Guy, and you have been watching the Coin Bureau.